thing I must say, that because I am participating in a workshop about raising the question, what kind of narrative theory for music and narratology? First thing I should say is that I'm going to talk about narratives in music, but that I am not going to talk about uh, uh, musical uh, narratives. So uh, actually, as it is said in, in the title of my presentation, I will raise the question about a narrative and non-narrative curiosity in the case of the riddles in Puccini's Turandot, but it will be an analysis uh, on the riddles as a literary text which signifies within the uh, musical narrative context of, the, of Puccini's uh, opera. So the second thing I, I wanted to say before starting is that uh, I would like to stick on the on the text analysis of the of the riddles, I I don't know if I will have the time to analyze the three of them because it would be quite long. But at least I would like to focus on the on the first one and to uh, analyze very specific features, which uh, which will allow me to claim that actually there would not be such a thing as a narrative curiosity, but that we would be talking of narrativized curiosity, and that music would play an, an important role in, in that process. So uh, the goal of my, of my paper is to define that difference between narrative and non-narrative curiosity from both a discursive and a cognitive point of view. Such a goal uh, falls within my research framework. Uh, the research framework of my post postdoc project which aims at defining from that same uh, twofold perspective the very notion of narrative. In so far as curiosity and, as, and understood as the will to know something presents a large array of narrative and non-narrative variations ranging from the classical unknowns of a novel to a scientific equation or a riddle, I will consider curiosity to be one of the possible features of narrative, but not a necessary or a distinctive one. Its definition in any case, whether narrative or not, must be discursive and cognitive at the same time, for, uh, in my view, what we call curiosity would be our specific psychological response to a series of discursive stimuli. With the same in view, my methodological approach tries to integrate in a single common nomenclature the disciplines within discourse analysis, that is linguistics, rhetoric, and semiotic, and the uh, cognitive psychology. That is the goal of, the, of cognitive narratology, which has experienced a great development in the last two decades and con constitutes today, in my view, one of the most innovative approaches for this kind of problems. However, its scope and potential would go, in my view, beyond the mere realm of narratives. As cognitive narratology intends to unify, that is, to coordinate, uh, the approaches of discourse analysis and cognitive psychology in one single and inter interdisciplinary model, it introduces a major potential change in the methodology of numerous disciplines in humanities. Cognitive narratology provides us with a psychological nomenclature in coordination with a discursive description in order to redefine the narrative act of reading. Inasmuch as this changes our notion, that is, our vocabulary, of the very act of reading, it could be applied to many other discurs discursive realms, such as poetry, drama, essay, etc. Narratology would be in the vanguard of this change, but it would be also taking its first steps. The study, the study of narratives then, as well as the study of narrativization processes of other types of discourses, such as politics, science, etc., constitutes in itself a, a research field complex and wide enough not to tackle its extrapolation for the time being. My intention here is trying to define the difference between narrative and non-narrative curiosity, is to propound a very basic delimitation within just one of the main cognitive activities developed by any reader of narratives. Needless to say, such a delimitation will point at some of the basic distinctive features of narrative itself, that is, at some of the discursive and cognitive features setting the border between narrative and non-narrative discourse as cognitive acts. In order to define such a dichotomy, I have chosen an example 
where narrative and non-narrative curiosity appear jointly, the non-narrative part subsumed in the narrative one. That is what happens in Giacomo Puccini's last opera, Turandot, which is based on the play by the same name of, by Carlo Gozzi, which is in turn inspired by the Persian tale, The Seven Beauties, collected in one and 1001 Nights by the French Orientalist François Petit de la Croix. In the second scene of the second act of Puccini's opera, Princess Turandot presents three riddles to Kadaf, her foreign asutor, in order to clear the main unknown of the story, whether she will accept to marry him in case he answers correctly, or she will order to kill him if he makes one single mistake. We are facing here what seems like a paradox, a non-narrative, curiosity-based genre, the, the riddle, not really telling anything, which lies at the very core of a classical narrative, the opera, and and even becomes its main source of curiosity. We are asking ourselves all the time, if, will Calaf answer correctly and marry Turandot, or will he fail and be killed? As, as we will see later, it is not the content of the riddles themselves what arous arouses our curiosity here, but their structural position in the opera and the narrative meaning arising from it. Such a juxtaposition, which turns out to be not paradoxical at all, provides us with an outstanding example, both for its constitution and for its semantic complexity, in order to analyze the narrative, non-narrative borders of curiosity. Starting from Puccini's example, the hypothesis I would like to raise here is that curiosity constitutes, contrary to the assertions of many authors, a non-narrative cognitive act by definition, and that it can only be narrativized by other elements in its context. The essential non-narrativity of curiosity would be due, in my view, to two fundamental reasons. The fir first reason would be that curiosity lacks in itself the resources for psychological identification, which are indispensable for any narrative. And the second reason would be that curiosity can allow itself to do without a well-defined and coherent place, time, and person they exist, also indispensable for any narrative. And that, that lack of a time, place, and person that exists would be substituted by a metaphorical or a, a conceptual cognitive frame. The only feature shared by curiosity and narrative and narrativity is the, the quest of a causal solution for the unknowns. Otherwise, curiosity may be narrativized, as I said before, by other elements in its context, for example, by means of its introduction in the point of view of a character. It is what Rafael Baroni calls a discrete curiosity, that is, a curiosity avoiding a psychological distance effect between the reader and the characters. That would be the case of Turandot, not really opposing a narrative to a non-narrative curiosity, but rather a non-narrative to a narrativized curiosity. As a reference of the notion of narrativity, I will follow here the definition of narrative given by Umberto Eco in Lector in Fabula, which is um, an echo understands a narrative as a description of actions demanding for each depicted action an agent, an, a, a, an intention of the agent, a state or, or possible world, a change with its cause and the purpose determining it. So, uh, as it, it is obvious for the definition, Echo uh, doesn't introduce in, in his definition of narrative the reaction of the reader, but he provides some features of what uh, that, that reaction could be. So, uh, uh, using or having resource to uh, Rafael Baroni's reading of those features, and uh, more specifically using Baroni's uh, concept of narrative tension, I, I, I would approach the, the analysis of, of the riddles in Puccini's turned out. Such a tension, such a narrative tension, uh, would, would be grounded in three main foundations. The first one would be the creation of a suspense, which uh, would not necessarily uh, have to be a uh, uh, to get a solution. I mean, the, the very fact of rising an unknown, the very fact of creating a suspense would be enough. The second uh, basis would be the creation of a psychological identification, 
uh, of the reader with at least one of the characters. And the third uh, element would be the cognitive immersion of the reader in a defined coherent place, time, and person they exist. The analysis of Turandot will allow us to verify how curiosity, once exhibited by the riddle, proves to be no narrative in itself, even if it's narrativized by its concept. And then I think it's, it's an important uh, uh, research field for the uh, narratology because uh, it provides uh, what Gerard Dunet called the negative limits of narrative. So as long as, uh, uh, so to the extent to which uh, a riddle is quite close to the uh, main rules of narrativity, but it's not narrative, it's, it's uh, defining that, that border in a very precise way. Um, some of the basic concepts in cognitive narratology, such as curiosity or suspense, were defined by Stem Stemberg in the begin at the beginning of the 70s and then to the, to the early 90s. But uh, his approaches are, are very much stick to the very discursive features, and that's, that's one of the main critics of Rafael Baroni, to his proposal. And um, so I, I will interpret or I will use the uh, concepts of suspense and curiosity from the point of view of Stenberg, but having resource to, to the reading or to the redefinition by uh, Baroni. So according to Baroni, the main difference between curiosity and suspense when it comes to creating a narrative tension is that curiosity addresses events which have already happened as a mere diagnosis, and it usually includes a large array of anachronisms or what uh, Gerard Genet called prolepsis and analepsis. On the contrary, suspense is based on the respect to chronology and is formulated as a prediction regarding the events to come. <clears throat> According to, the, to these definitions, it, it appears quite clearly that the riddles in Turandot do not create suspense by themselves, but rather the audience's curiosity, for they, they raise an unknown, not make an allusion to anything to come, but, something all, but to something already happened or always happening in the same way. So in, in that sense, it's a diagnosis. Nevertheless, it also becomes obvious that the riddles fulfill a twofold function in Trendot, for they do not only work as questions, but also as unknowns about collapse destiny. This is it what makes a vehicle of, of suspense out of them by means of an association to a certain psychology and to a defined and coherent place, time, and person they exist. In other words, the riddles become narrativized, and as curiosity enters, the more narrative channel of suspense as an unknown referring to the future, in this case, to collapse future. I will now analyze the, the riddles one by one, if I have the time, in order to explain how the three elements, that is uh, causality, identification, and they exist, uh, were together within or around that uh, non-narrative misanavim of, of the riddles. So uh, I don't know if I have the time just to play the, the first riddle. Well, I, I will start reading the, the text of the riddle. <clears throat> Turandot says in the first riddle, stranger listen, in a gloomy night an iridescent phantom flies, it spreads, it spreads its wings and rises over infinite black humanity. Everyone invokes it, everyone implores it. But the phantom disappears at dawn to be reborn in the heart. And every night it's born, and every day it dies. The answer of Calaf, which is who is known at that point of the story as the unknown prince, is yes, it's reborn, it's reborn and exulting, it carries with me, it, it carries with me, it carries me with it, Turandot, it is hope. So we should under, understand that, uh, that iridescent, iridescent phantom flying in the gloomy night, spreading its wings and, uh, over infinite black humanity, being invoked and being implored, etc., would be hope. Uh, in, uh, in both Turandot and uh, Collapse uh, perspective. 
So um, the description presented here by Turandot is, by virtue of its mystery, a great implicit question that is what we actually understand by a riddle. No question marks or interrogative elements are needed in order to make us feel uh, the, necess the necessity of an answer, that is, the necessity of fulfilling our curiosity. Kalaf's answer, however, turns out to be quite surprising, even if it proves to be correct in Turandot's own criterion. We could not say it is a causal answer, as it belongs in narrative discourse, if we understand by causality whether a consecutive unnecessary relationship between two or more events or the uh, loose relation uh, of the post hoc ergo proper hoc, that is, that which comes later should be the cause of what came before. <clears throat> it, it does not seem to fit in any known cultural standard the reason why hope, solution to, the, to this riddle, dies every day and is reborn every night by definition. Instead of hope, we could have thought of sleep or dreams as a more consistent answer to Turandot's description. The kind of causal relationship we tend to associate to narrative shows here considerably challenge. We could that, thus state that regarding this first riddle, our curiosity is not at all satisfied in a common narrative way. In reference to psychological identification, there do not seem to be either any elements inciting us to it. This is maybe the aspect of, of this first riddle showing a more obvious non-narrative nature, and in general, this is also the main non-narrative aspect of the riddle itself as a genre. We are facing here pure curiosity, or what it's also called exhibited curiosity, that is, curiosity openly so shown as such, entailing a psychological distance effect with the reader, usually introduced by a metalepsis. That is exactly what happens in Turandot. The princess addresses Calab, saying, stranger, listen, to the effect that she's finally going to tell the riddles everybody has been talking about. There is no mitigating factor for the for the psychological distance here, here exhibited by the metalepsis. Our narrative knowledge as members of the audience does not fit in with knowledge of any character we could identify with. We have less information than Calaf and Turandot, and there is no element in the riddle providing the necessary psychological anchorage, that is, there are no feelings, no intentions for an identification. The allegorical figure of the iridescent phantom showing up only at night or humanity as a whole, that is an anonymous community, invoking and imploring the phantom, do not constitute a proper basis for psychological identification, for they, they fail to fulfill the most fundamental condition for any kind of identification, that is the features rendering a subject capable of feelings and intentions. As for the axis, it shows absolutely ambiguous regarding time and place coordinates, and it only becomes a bit more defined in the personal level, even if not much. We are told about night and day, but the allusion to their cyclical character, every night, every day, prevents us from defining a present moment as a point of reference to regard to a past moment or to a future moment. There are no contradictions here, but a considerable and a deliberate deictic ambiguity. We hear about the cycle of night and day, about the apparition and the vanishing of a phantom, as if as if it was about a general and eternal principle or of a very loose and immeasurable temporal extension. Place the axis, for its part, raises the same problem. The phantom flies over the infinite humanity. It appears and disappears without the audience knowing which way. There are up and down coordinates more symbolic than the ictic, placing the phantom over humanity, invoking and imploring it. Besides, such a humanity lacks space in space limits by definition, for it has been described as infinite. Once again, the riddle shows here not a contradiction, but a great ambiguity. We do not, we do not even know the extension taken up by the human community mentioned by the riddle, where, whether it matches up with the place the axis of the story of Turandot, or it includes other fictitious places out of stage. Person the axis finally brings us back to the problem of psychological identification for the persons of verb would be the grammatical vehicle for such an identification. Only the phantom, however, 
as an individual figure presented a defined person that exists, unlike humanity, as an anonymous community. Nevertheless, the lack of identity features, once again, feelings and intentions in the figure of the phantom prevents us from identifying with it despite its static definition, that it's despite, uh, it prevents us from considering it a proper character. To sum up, there is a lack in this riddle of psychological identification or deictic definition, and even of causality, whether in a scientific or a narrative way, which constitute the main obstacles to put curiosity on an equal footing with narrativity. It is only because we are aware of the implications of the riddle for the characters and for the action of the opera that we attach some narrative tension aiming at the future to this non-narrative mise en abyme. I don't know if I have time for analyzing the third riddle. No. So I, I get to the conclusions. Well, the analysis of, of this riddle and of the more or less uh, same problems in, in the second and the third one with some small variation uh, allows us to verify the absence or a very ambiguous presence of the futures we had considered to be necessary for in the narrative. That is the causality, the psychological identification, and a defined and consistent deixis. We may thus confirm the non-narrative nature of curiosity, at least as it is raised by the riddles here. The, there would still remain, however, the outstanding question of defining the place held by the riddle in the vast field of non-narrativity, for it has proved to be, in several respects, a limit of narrative, and that's its border position turns out to be of a great interest for narratology following Gerard Genet's idea of defining the negative limits of narrative. If we summarize the common features of the three riddles, we will realize that psychological identification, for example, is totally absent uh, of them all. In other words, the exhibited curiosity and always entails a psychological distance effect without the gap of such distance being filled by any other resource. As for causality, it has been challenged, except in the last case, by a certain distortion of the consecutive and unnecessary nature of relationships between the de depicted events. As I said in this, in this regard, only metaphorical allusions, not clearly stated as such, for example in second riddle, could justify the link between the question and its allegedly correct causal answer. As regards the axis, there is no question about its referential ambiguity in all cases, disregarding any defined time and place shifters and reducing person shifters to very schematic allusions. As I also said, speaking of the second riddle, descriptive ambiguity and or conceptual abstraction would be the main reason for such vagueness in place and time coordinates. All of which would lead us to suggest two alternative cognitive frames to deictic definition and coherence as well as to psychological identification in order to explain the non-narrative cognitive activity of the riddle. Those two options would be synthesized by the metaphor and the concept, that is, by the cognitive frames par excellence of lyric and argumentative discourse. Sure enough, neither psychological identification nor deictic coherence are relevant features in metaphorical or conceptual cognitive frames and only causality could make part of them, even if not necessarily. The metaphor, which has indeed constituted the main discursive and cognitive frame in the three riddles, consists of a transgression of a referent by an image or a vehicle. It represents the most clear alternative to the deictic frame of narrative as a coherent and defined tenor, for it aims at its transgression in a temporal and in a spatial uh, sense. From its etymology, the metaphor alludes to a semantic transgression, to a transfer of meaning. We generally attach an aesthetic value to the metaphor, or what the Russian formalist used to call a poetic function. Uh, in the riddles, however, the permanent transgression of the tenor by the metaphor uh, fulfills rather a dialectic function, for it aims at the rhetorical defeat of the rival, which in, in Kalaf's case, uh, would have such a clear extralinguistic defeat as death. 
On the other hand, those metaphors also show what we could consider as conceptual features, that is, a certain kind of epistemic orientation. They would not only go beyond the ictic borders, but also beyond physical borders, for they refer to abstract notions searching for general validity. Coming back to etymology, what is metaphorical would be also metaphysical in many respects. The first riddle, for example, presents the general notion of hope as a solution. The second riddle, on the contrary, refers to such a concrete element, such as blood, but it could be interpreted as a metaphor of human will or character. Only the third riddle would belong to the non-abstract realm represented by the characters of the opera, and it would be used as such a link, as such, sorry, to link the non-narrative passage of the riddle with the general narrative of the opera. The conceptual features would therefore mix in the riddle with metaphorical features in a, in a more or less explicit manner, given as a result that particular mixture, enigmatic and didactic characteristic of the riddle. The discursive and cognitive relationships between the concept and the metaphor have been frequently tackled in the history of ideas since Nietzsche, Freud, uh, Lacan, Derrida, and so on. It's, it's not a, a new problematic. However, it, it was not my intention to enter here such a sort of analysis of the question. I just wanted to stress how the riddle constitutes a privileged research field for the theory of narrative and mainly for the study of its interdiscursive limits. This is due not only to its semantic complexity within such a small textual dimensions, but also to its particular fluctuation in a hybrid structure with the metaphoric, with, where the metaphor usually works as an unknown, while the concept provides its, own, its solution. Neither they exist nor psychological identification are required here, and in that respect, we are facing an, an alternative, and thus a limit uh, of nar to narrative, which is of a great value of, for, uh, uh, sorry, for uh, cognitive narratology. Thank you very much.